I know that by default, when spooky season comes around, people pick up scary books, right? Horror is the thriving genre in the season. But I don't know, for me, it always is the season that brings me to asking myself, what really scares me? What is something in books that will incite fear? Last year when I read a uh, short story collection books uh, that features scary or creepy content, I've come to terms. I had a lot of realization last year that what really scares me, what really terrifies me are stories that are unsettling, disturbing, creepy, something that's not really supernatural, if you get what I mean. Uh, it has to be very closely related to practical real life for me to consider it spooky. I think I've always known that supernatural horror does not really scare me growing up as a kid who's not really terrified of horror movies at all. That's something odd about me, by the way. Uh, as a child, usually you, you expect children to be scared, right? When watching horror movies. I, I never do. I don't. <laughs> This year, what I'm attempting is something that really scares me so much in the most practical sense. <laughs> You've seen the thumbnail, right? You've seen the title. When I started this channel, I've talked about how this is quite perhaps one of the oldest books that I have on my TBR pile. Um, I think it's already almost a decade, if it isn't a decade yet, that this is on my shelf. This has been gifted to me by my best friend, Cherry. For some reason, she's she's an amazing human, and she was able to to see that this is part of my wish list back in 2013, and she bought me this as a birthday gift. So that was a decade ago. A decade ago, it was so expensive. I I don't know how Cherry managed to score a copy of this expensive title just for me, and she did that on one of the worst years of my life. My best friend my best friend <laughs> i love her cherry i've been so loud and so annoying about how 2023 has been a spectacular phenomenal reading year for me so far uh quantity wise though not so much because i'm not beating my record of last year it's all about quality this year <laughs> i'm not planning to beat the 45 books that i read last year um but yeah this is a huge doorstopper <laughs> I think this is 700 pages long. So yeah, there's my commitment. Uh, I'm willing to spend the rest of my year off. Close it with House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I don't know how long <laughs> will it take me to, to finish this, but... suit for the spooky season. Here's the courage. Here's to overcoming our fears.
have the guts to to tell you to admit how long i've spent so far reading house of leaves <laughs> it's so embarrassing i i don't think i can i <laughs> i'm only approaching the halfway mark so far and what i can tell you for sure definitely without question this is the book that i am spending the longest time reading as expected no surprises i'm on page 323 right now so <laughs> I'm not really even technically on the halfway mark yet, but I just thought it's about time for me to sit down and say something because you know what? The entire reading process of The House of Leaves has been such a roller coaster experience. House of Leaves started very, very promising. I really wish I could have recorded my reaction when I started reading this book because that opening was iconic. <laughs> it is not really a spoiler, but this is how it goes. This is not for you. <laughs> 
that I really interpreted as a very powerful challenge, sort of like a dare. So I was telling the book, oh, you think you know me? Are you challenging me? Therefore, I, I really, really am so impressed with the introduction, uh, the first couple of chapters. I told myself I will definitely give my first impression once I reach the 100 page mark. But then, as I go through the pages, it becomes more and more difficult, if I'm gonna really be honest here, um, that it came to a point where I'm so tempted to believe what it said on the opening that maybe this is really not for me. <laughs> My feelings change as it progresses. So when I reached the 100 page mark, I decided mm, maybe I should wait until I reach page 200. And then when I got there, I told myself, mm, maybe I should go continue until page 300 because I really don't know what to feel. It's so uncertain and I, I keep you know, flipping, switching my opinions every now and then. To be honest, up until now, I can't even tell you for sure how I feel exactly about this book. <laughs> if House of Leaves was written with the intention of making you question so many things in life because it discussed, it tackled so many things, right? If that was the purpose, then I can say it succeeded because I have so many questions in my mind. I'm so puzzled with so many things about what's going on with this book. But I want to be straightforward when I say that it evoked many questions in my head. I don't really mean that in a thought-provoking way. More like I'm so perplexed with so many things. So I can't even say if it's a good or bad thing. I'm truly not a big fan of talking about spoilery things uh, whenever I say my thoughts about a book. So I, I typically refrain from doing so, but I can't help it. I need to do it right now to give you context or to provide a defense of my perplexed feelings, my confusion. So far, House of Leaves, to me, feels like a book review of a book review about a book written as a movie review <laughs> analysis regarding a movie about the architecture of a house. So, do, do you understand where I'm coming from? This is 700 pages long, and this feels like you're reading multiple books inside a book with so many footnotes. <laughs> and then there are small things, like uh, Truant's part in the footnotes, or his thoughts and commentary about Zampano's work. Um, he constantly misspells would have and writes it like the commonly misspelled writing of it to would have, could have, should have. <laughs> I really, really want to Google if that was intentional and if that was a creative choice that speaks about his character or I don't know, his inexperience. But I don't want to Google it because I want to refrain or I want to avoid encountering spoilers as much as I can. Also, since I'm reading House of Leaves in what's touted and called as the TikTok era, right? Where our attention spans in the digital age is really decreasing. I wonder how much of what's discussed here can still stand relevant, um, appropriately complex in that perspective. <laughs> Somehow I feel like even if I reach the end of this book, I'll really just incur so much more questions. <laughs> Let's see, let's see, let's see. House of Flames, definitely a book like no other. Also, very, very funny how I'm sort of thinking how much of my life replicates what went on with the maze-like adventure of the house here because um, I had a great, wonderful time with Cherry and Ira when we went to Arden Island, so I'm taking my family along. We're coming back. 300 more pages to go. Fingers crossed that I would really finish this before the year ends. Oh my goodness. See you later.
second time <laughs> second time in a row <laughs> I'll recommend this place yeah
House of Leaves is truly that kind of book that puts you halfway through in between the urge to just talk nonstop in an unlimited period of time about your thoughts and feelings about the book and at the same time the wanting to just shut up <laughs> because you don't know where to begin you're so scared that you will just you will just talk and talk and talk nonstop so <laughs> i already talked about how this is definitely setting the record as the book that i'm taking the longest time to complete in my reading life but also very obviously um this is the book that i tabbed the most so far so yeah um for, for those wanting to pick this up uh as you can probably already tell by reviews this is something that you would really like to to document i'm gonna talk more about that later but yeah um <laughs> i had to have so many tabs in the process of documenting my experience in this book i already talked about how there are countless so many footnotes in this book and this story right and to be brutally honest it truly feels like you are reading scholarly literature so yeah admittedly it often felt like a chore <laughs> so uh that's part of why I, I dragged and took such a long time getting through the plot because <laughs> i mean i appreciate the confidence of the author to believe that I am academically, intellectually capable of keeping up. But I'm, I'm just saying that if you're someone with challenges on patience, because I already talked about how we are in the TikTok era, right? So our attention spans can be quite limited every now and then. Um, good luck. <laughs> but at the same time, House of Leaves is the kind of book which... If you manage to get to the end and finish and complete, you will be very, very proud of surviving it. The moment that you finish the book, the urge to really broadcast to the world that, hey, I finished reading House of Leaves. Am I not awesome? <laughs> I actually rewatched my thoughts uh, when I was halfway through the book to compare how I felt then versus how I'm feeling now, now that I'm done to see if there are any changes. And why don't we start? Why don't we start by the question, the one and only question that I've raised. There's another one that I'm gonna talk about in a bit, but the question that I raised was the frequent misspelling by Johnny Truant, right? And I was wondering if that was intentional or whatever the reason for that is, right? I looked it up, finally, when I finished, since I'm no longer afraid of spoilers because I already completed the book. I looked it up. And you know what? <laughs> the internet doesn't have an answer for me. They also don't know why. Why there are misspellings. And there were a lot of speculations and theories. There were even some who th are thinking that it could be an honest mistake by Mark C. Dinoluski. But... <laughs> There were supposed to be editors, right? Like, like I'm not really just referring to the actual editors in the publishing industry, the true to life publishing industry. There are supposed to be editors on here, on the plot, who are making commentary as well on Zampana's work, as well as Johnny Truant's additional commentary. So, <laughs> there's already a very high probability of this becoming my longest ever exclusive reading vlog for a book. So I decided that I'll just focus on things that I love about this book, my favorite things about House of Leaves that truly made me think and I have so much thoughts about. I'm just gonna focus on that. Why don't we start by the very powerfully subtle exploration of unreliable narrators. Circling back to that earlier question that I just said, right? And the one question that I held back from asking, which is, Zampano and his visual impairment and how it kind of questions the credibility because how do you make sense of someone's fascination ordering on obsession about something that they do not really experience because Zampano is the one responsible for doing the work uh, which is analyzing and critiquing the Navidson content right 
and he's visually impaired. I'm not diminishing people with visual impairment. I'm just saying, in order for you to craft the work that you're doing, he had to work with people, students, had to reference so many pieces of literature. Do, do you find that credible? Someone doing a critique of something that they do not really see for themselves. So, <laughs> I will probably get it. I will probably understand and accept it easily if it's something like, I don't know, their love for music, sports, um, what else? Food, cooking, things that they can experience and do, right? But if you're doing a critique of a movie that has a lot of visual elements to, to consider and analyze, and you are visually impaired, therefore you have to rely on other people to, to tell you what's being shown, Wh what's the merit? <laughs> There's a brilliant quote uh, at the beginning of one of the chapters here, um, chapter 22, if I'm looking at that correctly where it says, the truth transcends the telling by Eno. I think that's a very, very appropriate, perfect, accurate um, summary of things that took place in House of Leaves. The truth transcends the telling. I was so invested in that quote being so appropriate to what took place in here that I even tried to Google and look up Eno, the one credited for that quote, right? Eno to try to see where exactly that came from and guess what i couldn't find <laughs> so even that was fictional and made up by marcy dingaluski so that was zambano being an unreliable narrator himself right and there were portions towards uh during the uh, the end part of the book where johnny truant uh wrote a lot of entries happening in his life happening in his real life and then it was so dramatically full of really striking moments that it was up and down, up and down. And then there came a part where it talks to you, the reader, asking you, oh, so you believe that? <laughs> and I had to close the book and say, how dare you make me undergo those feelings only to tell me, did I was played? Did I got fooled? Did I was naive? <laughs> so this is kind of a big spoiler to say, but I I've considered this speculation, okay? I'm thinking did Johnny fabricate the entire thing? Was everything made up? Even Sampano, the original work he's supposed to be doing a commentary of, even that was his own conjuring his own fabrication even that was fake is that why was the misspelling intentional in order to fool you that they are two different things so sampano was his own creation <laughs> there were bits and pieces on the footnotes that i tried to google to try to verify if those are real works because there were even some well-known figures credited here for providing comments that it, it made me ask, is everything really fake? Because it's a mixture of factual and fictional references, right? So in a way, it, it truly invites you as a reader to participate. It's very inclusive that way because it involves you in the process of checking what is fact, what is fiction, and it sort of already feels like dark academia for real. <laughs> I promise I'm not exaggerating. There's really a part nearing the end of the book where I had to write. <laughs> I was forced, okay? I was forced to do it. It really is kind of a spoiler to say this, but to give you context, um, that part was regarding the letter written by someone. I'm gonna, not going to say who, but there's a letter written by someone in a psychological uh, mental institution who is writing and asking for help because she's saying that something is being done to her and they are changing or modifying her letter for the truth not to get out. So 
she provided an instruction in order for the code to be deciphered. So in order for you to make sense of what's being written, you have to work it out yourself. Therefore, I have to. <laughs> you are participating as a reader. Isn't that so unique? So our elevation as readers from just a mere spectator to an actual participant to the plot is so remarkable and made me remember my question about the significance of this being so long and so challenging against the current TikTok era, right? And you know what? Uh, there's a very interesting part over here where it talked about the authenticity of the experience being something so attention-grabbing, which kind of mirrors that, right? Jay Leno quipped, You know how they made the Nabidson record? Left the landscape on. This really was a home movie. While well, Letterman scowled, Think about it, folks. No stars, no crew, no locations. Very inexpensive. A lot of studios are taking this idea very seriously. Seriously. Whereupon the lights on the stage were turned off for several seconds. On Home Improvement, Tim Allen offered a one-minute parody in the dark, mostly having to do with stubbed toes, broken dishware, and misdirected gropes. Which then again aligns and returns back to the challenging sentence, right? The truth transcends the telling. But in another way of looking at it, another pr perspective is, what if the telling outsolds the truth? What really matters? Do we know? So talking about reality, right? Um, the two significant uh, discussions that I also am obsessed with in The House of Leaves would be the exploration, the discussion about photojournalism as a recognized art and its significance in documenting parts of history. Lindsay Gertnard commented, Davidson ran straight into the brick wall all great photojournalists inevitably run into. Why aren't I doing something about this instead of just photographing it? And when you ask that question, you hurt. Psychologist Hector Liosa took Gertnard's observation a little further when he pointed out at the LA Times Convention on Media Ethics last March. Photojournalists especially must never underestimate the power and influence of their images. You may be thinking, I've done nothing in this moment except take a photo, true. But realize you have also done an enormous amount for society at large. Also true. And then I thought it would be really fitting to wrap up this off-tangent review, <laughs> scattered review, uh, by talking about, discussing about its thoughts about the creative pursuits, about art, and what we do in lieu of things that we are very, very into, passionate about. Passion has little to do with euphoria, and everything to do with patience. It is not about feeling good, it is about endurance. Like patience, passion comes from the same Latin root, body. It does not mean to flow with exuberance, it means to suffer. The truth transcending the telling. How much of that is true? How much of that is accounted for? Do we know? Why do we always tend to always remember and consider highly things that break our hearts, things that make us cry, things that make us go through suffering? I really, really struggled with uh, the statement of artists being so out there that they tend to disconnect from the intimacy of their relationships with their families about the people that matter to them. There are seven incarnations and six correlates necessary to becoming an artist. Number one, explorer, courage. Number two, surveyor, vision. Number three, minor, strength. Number four, refiner, patience. Number five, designer, intelligence. Number six, maker, experience. Number seven, artist. First, you must leave the safety of your home and go into the dangers of the world. Whether to an actual territory or some unexamined aspect of the psyche, this is what is meant by explorer. Um, that part about artists needing to, to go out into the world, 
in order to pursue what they'd like to pursue. As an introvert, <laughs> I feel like I'm diminished and disregarded. Because what about us who would like to believe that we can still craft, do storytelling, make art, make something out of things that we can think of on our own? What about us? And you know what comes to mind? You know what comes to my memory when that is being discussed? Isolation and the pursuit of something academic, something artistic? You're a Nessie. <laughs> and you're a Nessie succeeded in exploring that in... House of Leaves, really something that you will be proud of yourself about accomplishing. It's the kind of book that makes you want to congratulate yourself <laughs> for surviving, so yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Here's to overcoming books that we are intimidated by and emerging as better readers.